Greetings, everyone. P. Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Four Fusion Friday. It's the first Friday of the month. We've got not only some classic albums to talk about here today, we've got two very special guests. We got uh, viewers Joe Grinvalski and Mike Klingenberg. Welcome to the show, guys. Wait, wait a second. Isn't this the? I thought I was being interviewed for the part of Punk Parade job. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> Give me a minute. Give me a minute. I can do that too. <laughs> now, just so uh, everyone knows, this is uh, the one year anniversary. Yeah. Can you believe it? A little show that could. We are at a one year anniversary show, and uh, we wanted to do something to commemorate that. So we decided to make the guest chair for this one viewers appreciation so we took guys that were in the youtube comments in the chats and also in uh facebook comments so anybody that's got that triple play was basically on a very short list and we got a few guys cool cool okay now i'm prepared there you go april fools to you joe <laughs> <laughs> see that george we, we we did get some people right four minutes in i was almost convinced almost I, convinced i was watching i'm going I know Pete doesn't like punk. I know that. What's going on here? <laughs> well, anybody who's been watching the channel for a while knows that. So I was surprised at how many people were thoroughly convinced. Like, oh, yes, this is going to be awesome. I can't wait. And I'm like, really? I knew it wasn't. I knew it wasn't George because he he's always expressed that he's hated it. <laughs> <laughs> we sold it. Well, he threw <laughs> Chuck in the mix, too. And that got me because he's talking about yeah. how much he respects Chuck. And I'm like. Really, is this happening? And then, of course, I'm like, ah, four one. There we go. Yeah, that's right. So, in addition to Joe and Mike, uh, of course, we've got the stalwarts of the show here, Mr. George Lemay, Mr. Eric Porter. And uh, with that being said, this is our one year anniversary. So, congrats, I guess, to the three of us for uh, keeping this little thing going. And uh, people who watch this show, we may not have the viewership of the Hudson Valley Squares or in the proxy, but the people who watch this show once a month really love it. And I think the most important thing is we love doing it. So uh, it's going to keep going. So with that, I will turn it over to George, who is going to uh, give some new releases that are coming out. And then we'll get into the uh, the four albums for today. Uh, just a couple this month. Uh, first one is Anton Davidian's Avalanche. This is the debut solo album from a friend of mine who has spliced up a lot of records over the last 15 years or so. He's a bassist out of Russia. Enviable technique, musical lines, always. Um, here he has foregone the traditional electronic electric fusion disc in favor of sort of a chamber fusion third stream kind of release. It's a, a jazz trio with a chamber orchestra, the Open Sound Orchestra. The six-part suite that he had a friend of his compose, a guy named Bard Bardan Obsepian, um, it's great playing, and it, it it scratches an itch if you like orchestral twinge material. It's, if that's something that appeals to you, the thought of the jazz trio and an orchestra, uh, I don't know how much better it gets than this. It's really good stuff. Uh, it's only on streamers. He he <laughs> he didn't want to make any. He said he didn't wasn't about making money. He just wanted people to hear his his stuff. So I guess it's admirable, but for everyone that's not on streamers, the ten percent of us were like, huh. But, <laughs> uh, the other one is uh, Igor Wilcox Quartet live at Bansko Jazz Fest 2022 this Cuban drummer's 2017 debut was a top 5 album of the year for me since then he's just put out 3 consecutive live albums and a couple digital singles uh, they're all good and this third one it smokes as well but uh, it's not entirely a play the hits release they're it's half that and then two of the digital singles that he's put out in the interim since the last album they're on here um so there is new stuff if you haven't followed all the singles but uh for me uh I, i'd like to see another studio album but for the initiate uninitiated this is as good a place to start as any with this stuff it's high energy uh it's a quartet with sax not guitar 
really good players, especially the bass player and the keyboard player, they're, they're smoking hot. That's on Bandcamp. Uh, Igor, Igor Wilcox Quartet. That's it. And as always, George, we'll put these down in the comments below so you guys can go check into them further. And uh, without further ado, uh, so when we were talking about what we would do for the year anniversary episode, uh, I suggested to George that, you know, maybe for the year episode, we pull out four absolute classics of the genre. So and I left it up to George to decide. And uh, so, George, why don't you introduce them and let us know how you came up with the four? Well, I thought the bands were pretty obvious uh, as far as cornerstones of the genre, what you would call the big four of fusion. But I didn't want people hassling me about why'd you pick this album, why'd you pick that album. So something we've done before is we've went to, gone to rate your music and picked the top rated album from each of those bands, which gave us a couple what we thought were surprises. So uh, the first band is Herbie Hancock. The album is Headhunters, 1973. And you got Mahavishnu Orchestra, The Inner Mountain Flame. From 71. Return to Forever, Where Have I Known You Before, 1974. And Weather Report, Black Market, 1976. So I always like to start with you, Eric. What is your number four? Well, good evening, everybody. Um, and I did want to thank Pete. Um, for allowing us to do this show and reaching the one year anniversary. This has been great. It's been a great learning experience for me and Joe and Mitch, welcome. Thank you both for watching. Um, we appreciate it. And like Pete said, it's always great to read the comments and, and see how many people really get into this show. Um, I always, I always go through them. I know these guys do too. So it's great to have that. So welcome. We appreciate you guys and, and everyone else out there who watches the show. Um, my number four, I'm going with Herbie Hancock, Headhunters. Probably where my bias comes in. Um, no guitar. Um, I, I find with this one, um, I've had it for a while. Um, it was something that I hadn't listened to in a while, so I went back and listened to it. I really like the funk, the groove that gets set up, but I think for me, a lot of the stuff, I think like the opening track, Chameleon, Sometimes they carry that a bit too long for me. The groove gets set, stuff starts going, um, but then it's like six, seven minutes of that groove. Um, the song I love on this one is Sly. I think that's the one where they really mix things up the most. You get a lot of different stuff. It's very punchy. Might not be as funky as uh, like the opener Chameleon, um, but to me, that's the one where everything kind of comes together. Um, some excellent electric piano in there. I just feel like it's a little more alive. Maybe it's a little more jazzy than funky. Um, but again, you're talking about classics, so it's it's not to put anything down. Um, my personal taste, like I said, I'm always I'm always looking for guitar. Um, that's missing from this one, obviously. But great classic stuff. I think 73, right? Release date on this one. Yeah. So this is right in that, you know, right in the wheelhouse of when Fusion was really hitting hard. Didn't have a long run, but um, I can see why this one was out there. And I think like this, I think when we talk about all these, this really obviously goes more to the funky side. Uh, it's probably the funkiest of the four, although they all have their little elements of that. But um no faulting it at all. Just for me, I find some of the longer songs a, a bit repetitive. Um, but overall, you know, like I said, I think this one kind of puts the funk at the forefront um, of the four that we picked here. So that's my number four is Headhunters. All right. Mike, what do you got it for? Headhunters. I would, uh, I'm probably going to match Eric. <laughs> because <laughs> i'm a, i'm um i'm a guitar guy too but um yeah i mean chameleon it's it's uh, iconic you know the bum, 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 you know watermelon man it's kind of cool he blows into beer bottles and makes that an instrument <laughs> <laughs> and uh sly yeah i like how they get into the they get into kind of the the latin latin fusion in the middle of it 
and um and I, the, the last track i i can kind of do without you know it's it's just kind of slow and meandering and, and pretty long what is it yeah so i mean yeah head hand orders for me it's classic but um something's got to be at four so yeah all right joe what you got well when i saw the four that you provided us well first and foremost thank you for the opportunity this it's a great honor and privilege because i've been, really been enjoying this show learned a lot bought too much but uh, it's been great <laughs> um, we all do so these records have pretty much been indelible for 35 sometimes 40 years for me and i thought i had an idea but i started to agonize because they're all you know pretty much touchstones of the genre and um Upon listening, my two, three, and four kept on a road a, a, a rotor dial. So I'm going to break up the universe road thus far, and I'm going with. Uh, I hope this comes in. I knew the shading would be horrible. The black market by weather report, and um, reason behind it is uh, very much like what the other gentleman was saying. There's no guitar. Um, this is the only record of the four involved that has polyphonic keyboards on it. So Joe Zalama was way on cutting edge. This is also the last recorded one in, in 76. Um, my take on it though, is that it's the weakest recorded of the pile. And what I mean what I mean by that, and it could be a partial engineering thing, mm -hmm. is that the keyboard's a little too dominant. Um, the, now you have Alfonso Johnson and Dr. Pistorius on certain tracks. Well, actually Pistorius is only on two. Uh, but Johnson's on the balance. And in terms of that aspect, you can't, it's really seamless in terms of that. You, the rhythm section is pretty much continuous throughout and they do their thing. But um, while I do like um, Black Market, great start. You have the dual drumming of Chester Thompson and... Um, Narada Walden. Narada Michael Walden. Narada, yeah. Narada Michael Walden is fantastic. And Alfonso Johnson holds his own considering you've got those two guys slamming and making some cacophonous noise going on, but it's great. Uh, my next track, I really feel, and Cannonball is too, has a little too much level of solemnity to it for me. It's good, but it's just, it's a little too solemn. But Gibraltar, I really enjoyed, always have. Um, it's got a, it tells a story. And that was one thing I do like about the record is that it does that little music on crep thing where you get these little interspersions of action, whether it's a train or with this one, you can hear the waves of a boat. And as if they're passing the big rock. Um, that's really good. Um, and then you have two more shorter compositions, which they're great, but they're, to me, a little too pastoral. Um, and then the track I really enjoy, which is a story is written one, which is Barbary Coast. And that's a very upbeat tune. I don't know what meter it's in. I think it's 6-4, but it's, it's very upbeat, very up-tempo. It's real. I really appreciate that one a lot. And then, but it's a little, I always thought it was on the short side. And then the last track is, an Alfonso Johnson composition. Uh, I always get this one wrong. Haranu. And uh, I always feel it's too short, but Johnson holds, his, again, Johnson holds his own. He makes it sound seamless. Like you can't tell him between what his tracks are and what Pistorius does because they both bring they both bring that funkiness. So I, I appreciate that aspect, but I think besides no guitar on this one as well, I think it's a little too, I guess, pan-cultural and it's 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 not as tied into fusion as I am comfortable at, with hearing. So um, one had to be up for that had to be it. All right, Pete. Well, this is a uh, four interesting albums and four great albums, and I love all four of them a lot. And I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're all the best from each outfit, right? Maybe. But interestingly enough, two have some really killer guitar playing on them, and two don't have any guitar playing at all. <laughs> but uh, the two that don't have guitars have some pretty damn good bass playing on both of them. One had to go at number four, and I feel bad that Black Market is going to be number four here, but something's got to go there. I really like this album a lot. Uh, I will say, you know, I'm going to echo a lot of what Joe said. Uh, as far as like the the great tracks on here, I think uh, Haran New 
is terrific, the last song. And of course, it's the only one written by Alfonso Johnson. I really like that a lot. And he really stands out on that. That's really good. Barbary Coast is a classic Pastoria, Pastorius tune. I like the kind of like funky Caribbean sounds of that. I mean, he's just tremendous anyway. Uh, the title track is amazing. I love Gibraltar. Might be the most memorable song on here. Interestingly enough, the two songs that are written by Wayne Shorter are, are probably my least favorites on here. And I love Wayne Shorter. And I think my biggest issue with this album is that I find Mr. Shorter, who we just lost recently, who is a absolute legend, he's really underutilized on this album. I mean, other than in a couple spots, you barely know he's on here. And I love Zawinul. He's an amazing keyboard player. This is his album for the most part. It and is. his his keyboard sounds are amazing on here. He's a great writer. Um, I just find that this would be an even much better album if Shorter had more to do on here because he's supposed to be the co-leader of this band. Couldn't tell it by this album. But all that being said, still a tremendous album. I love it. It's To me, it's a top three, four, five weather report album of all time, but sits just a little bit below the other three for me. So there you go. My number four is uh, I don't own, which is Headhunters. I've never owned it. Um, to me, it's one of those albums that you're supposed to like kind of a thing. A lot of people probably use it as a marker of your taste even. Um, for me, like Eric said, for me, it, it's too static with the groups. Um, I like Funk Fusion more than mo most Fusion guys, but I like more the syncopated hitting the accents kind of stuff horn hits stuff like that this is more of that digging a groove and just laying into it for six seven eight minutes that only works for me if the soloists are you know really interesting and i don't feel like they are on this record i feel like they're just kind of there um i think it's a uh, pretty average stuff actually more more background music than anything i like uh sly the best easily they jumped the tempo on that one a little bit. And I would agree with a mic that face melter by the time that rolls around, I'm just kind of checked out. So for me, it's, this was the easiest one for me, for me to put it at four. Eric. Well, <clears throat> I'm going with black market at three, no guitar as, as we mentioned, but I will say I avoided weather report for a long time because of that fact. Um, and as we've done this show and I've been getting, uh, between George and Pete and everyone else who's been saying, check this out, check this out. I have been listening to them more. And I will say that I really black market. I really do enjoy, um, the title track. The opener is, is great. Um, I find them very musical, um, very melodic, strong musically. Um, I think Pete, you just brought up was it elegant people and three clowns? Those are kind of, they kind of suck a little life out of what's built up to that point. The clothes are hand new. Uh, again, that's terrific. Um, but I've really started to listen to them more and they were a band, like I said, that I kind of avoided because I knew they didn't have guitar kind of wasn't my thing. I, I, I think I got the live one was the first one I ever got. So I don't know one way or the other, but that's kind of where that sat on the shelf and I didn't go back to them. But I felt like I really had to give this band a chance because I'm getting into this music um, over the last couple of years. And I I really like this. I, it really is a good one. It was a great listen. I listened to all of these a bunch of times before we did the show. Um, it's just for me, like I said, it. I like my guitar. So it's it's not there, but... I definitely am impressed with Weather Report, and I am going to check out more of their stuff as we move, you know, as we move forward. Mike? Weather Report. I, I, it's one of the, it is one of those bands where I've always tried to really get into them, but it's like a lot of their stuff isn't, um, I don't know, um, I don't want to say heavy enough, but um, I don't know, it's a bit too... Uh, sleepy for my taste but this one kind of grew on me that's why i put it above uh above herbie hancock uh you know the the last track is it's like a fireworks of fusion like their grand finale that's pretty cool um 
but um cannonball cannonballs i yeah the the um jaco songs really i mean you can really tell it's him and he's only on two from what i saw yeah yep. and um yeah it uh, uh a lot of this kind of grew on me um uh the yeah the the songs where there's heavy horns is just kind of it's just, it's it's kind of skinamax <laughs> if you want uh, but yeah uh, the, it's a good it's a good record and i uh and it's the one i was least familiar with um because i've had the other ones for a while now but uh it grew on me in the past like week or so cool. joe what do you got at three back to the no guitar theory <laughs> now and the reason I put this at number three is I haven't been listening with headphones to these records for years. I just crank very much repeat, put them in the car, ride to work is about a half hour. You can get most of this done. That was the beauty of these records too, because most of them were around the 40, 45 minute or less mark. And this is a relatively short one. Um, the reason I do like it so much was listening to it in the headphones. Yes, the, the rhythm section is a little bit more plotting and more funky. And it's not the jazz tempos you tend to associate with fusion. However, the space between all the instruments and the level of the engineering is remarkable. You hear each instrument equally. And that's to me, is always important. And when you go to a live jazz show, which I go to quite a few a year, that's the beauty of a, a great show is everything's heard equally and everyone gets an equal share. And while Harvey Mason's drumming may be a little bit on the thin side, it, it gives a lot of space to let Herbie go nuts on every keyboard, no demand at the time. I think he had two different versions of ARPs. He had the Mini Moog and uh, uh, Clavinet and uh, the Fender Rhodes and probably a Hopner electric piano. He he just it's full on keys. Um, I do like the I do like the funkiness of it. Um, and um, Sly is actually a nod to Sly and the Family Stone. And they're my funk band. So, um, and it, it is definitely the standout track and album. Is uh, Chameleon a little bit too long? Absolutely. Uh, they could probably shave five minutes off of that. It'd still be great, but it just, it, it, it moves along too, too weak. Now, Watermelon Man is actually a remake that Private Mason did the arrangement for that is from uh, Herbie's first album, first solo album. So it's just a reworked composition. And then the last track, Vein, Vein Melter, actually, what I thought was interesting upon listening really good in the headset, uh, this record came out, I believe, in October of 73, recorded the month prior. So really tight time frame. Now, the band Can came out with their album Future Days in August. Now, their album, that album only has four tracks. It is very fusion-esque. It's, it's pretty much almost like on an ambient level, all the instruments are equal. I swear to God, upon listening, I'm like, it just has that feel, particularly on the, the, the vein melter. It was like, it sounds like Moonshake. And it was it was pretty amazing that I was able to make that connection. But uh, yeah, that's why that's why it's at three. Um, <laughs> it's missing the guitar and yeah, it is. Is as everyone has been saying, it's a little on the, uh, it's more funk. Now, what I thought was funny though is, this was the biggest selling jazz album prior to George Benson's Reason, which that took a while for me to register. I would have had no idea, no idea whatsoever. This was the big, and I think on even Rate Your Music was the highest rated record of them all. I was just going to oh. say that I wanted to mention that the way and, that ranked on Rate Your Music, Headhunters is number one out of these four. It, by a lot too. I was like, "Whoa, Not too it's much!" Just... But yeah, there's like two, and then two more. There's a space, but correct, yeah. correct. Pete, yeah, it's headhunters. Um... That, that's really wild when you think about that because this is not a very accessible album at all. You know, Breezen is one thing, right? You can understand why Breezen was such a big hit, but this is just like, you know, if I, I don't, I don't know if my wife has ever heard this album. I'm sure if I was playing this around the house, she'd probably give me this look like, what the fuck are you listening to, right? <laughs> um, but I really dig this. And I think other than Vein Melter, which, is, you know, Joe, your your comments are really interesting because to me, 
like one of the notes that I put down is it's it's very much kind of like space rock or kraut rock almost. And then when you mentioned can, I was like, well, that kind of totally makes sense. Yep. But to me, Vein Melter doesn't really blend well with the rest of the songs on the album. It's okay for what it is, but it's way too long. Uh, the Sly is terrific. Absolutely terrific. I love the newer take on Watermelon Man. And I really dig Chameleon. It is a little long, yeah, for sure. But I think Harvey Mason and Paul Jackson are just burning it up on that song. And man, Herbie's like array of keyboards on this album is just mind blowing. I mean, that's the reason to listen to this. I mean, yeah, it's got the deep grooves. It's funky as hell. The whole thing and the band is great. You know, Barney Maupin's great on here when he's screaming up on the sax. But for me, it's hearing Herbie lay all this stuff down, and it all just sounds so seamless. And and this is this is a headphones record. This is either something you crank up really, really loud or you listen to it on headphones and you just kind of let Herbie's magical fingers soak into your brain. It's good stuff. So I, I really dig this. I happen to like this era in Herbie's career. Uh, I like the Mwandishi stuff and I like a bunch of the albums that came after this. So I think he was doing something kind of different at the time, which I really appreciate. And does it suck there's no guitar in here? Yeah, but you know, then we get to hear more Herbie. So I'm okay with that. So that's my number three. And number three is weather report. I'm going to echo Eric. Uh, I had a couple of buddies, brothers, John and Matt, that uh, helped. they were helpful in getting me into some fusion stuff in the mid-80s. And uh, one of the bands they pushed hard was Weather Report. And I was resistant at the time because I was coming from a rock background. And I don't want to hear about a band with no guitar, you know. It just didn't register with me when there was all these other bands I could have checked out that, that did have guitar. So years later, when I finally got a little more mature or whatever, check into it. Yeah, there's a lot to like here. Uh, I That approach, though, kind of cost me because two of the good, really good songs on here, the title track, and I really like Elegant People, I approached them from hearing covers of them first. And the, for me, the covers are the definitive versions in my head now. <laughs> Fair or not, that's the way I hear them. And they... The covers that I like of them, I think they do them better than this. So now when I hear this, it's like, okay, yeah, I get that that's the start, but it's not what I hear in my head. Um, my favorite tracks are Gibraltar. That's actually got a little bit of darkness to it, which this record kind of lacks. It's got, it's mostly bouncy, that African, Caribbean feel. And like everybody else said, Harandanu, that's great. Uh, you don't hear a lot of songs in 11. And that's always struck me about that tune, that it's an 11. Um, actually, there's no bad songs. I, I could do without Three Clowns, I guess. It's a little a little sedate. But uh, this wasn't going to be any higher based on the fact that the two above it are just where they are in my head. So it had to be three. Eric, what's your two? <clears throat> well, now we get to the icons in my head. So... Um... My number two is Return to Forever. Um, this one, you know, um, I love it. I know maybe a lot of people might not care for the little piano interludes in between, but I think they're fantastic. I love listening to Chick. Um, and the songs themselves are just killer. I mean, Vulcan Worlds is an amazing opener. I think what really stood out to me on this record is... Obviously, you hear everybody. I love Al. I love Chick. But I'm listening to Lenny and Stanley lock in, and they're unbelievable. I mean, Stanley Clark, to me, stood out immediately in this record. I don't know why. I mean, I've listened to the other stuff as well. But And then I'm, I'm listening. And as I'm listening, I'm like, Lenny White is killing it. Absolutely killing it. Um, obviously, the closer, uh, Song of the Pharaoh Kings, epic, 14-minute plus. Um little you know start out but i i think i like that i mean things build you're building these songs you know you get chick kind of opening things up a little bit um and then they get cooking and i i listen to lenny and stanley at the end of that i think maybe the last few minutes and they're just fire absolutely smoking this was not an easy choice for me um but i love this record um but it's like we said, we got one and two, and this is my number two for today. Could be number one tomorrow. Who knows? 
the BGO remaster? Thing? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's a double. So no mysteries on this one as well. Mike, where you got it too? I got the same. And I also own that. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it's it, it's uh, awesome. I love Shadows of Low. Uh, Al's guitar work is freaking just blazing. It's really, really good. Um, and it's it, it's cool that um, uh, Earth Juice, like they're trying to they're trying to make the radio or or get on the dance floor, but like it's it's more of like a more of like a romp. I like the sound of the drums. It's not as clean. And of course, the whole rhythm section is just amazing. So, yeah, I've got uh, Mike. Was that to... one though? Because it's so short. Were you like, I just want this to keep going? Like that song, I just felt like. They get cooking, and then all of a sudden, it's like bang, it's done. What earth, the earth juice? Earth juice, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but um, it's uh, yeah, and then the, the the last song, song of the Pharaoh Kings, the the big epic. Like all of these, except for the Herbie Hancock, have these big epic. All the four we're talking about, except for the Herbie Hancock, have these big epic like the uh, fusion moments at the end of the albums uh and that one yeah that one's awesome um where have i loved you before and all and all those interludes those are cool for what they are but you know i can do without those um beyond the seventh galaxy of course is a classic but yeah this is this is um awesome it's really unique the way it's recorded joe what you got Hit in the repeat. Um, now here's the, here's a funny thing. Um, out of all the musicians of all these bands, the one I've always been quite familiar with is Aldi Miola because we share the same birthday. Mm -hmm. So so I've always I've known about him since '73, and uh, and it was actually I never knew I didn't associate it being this record. There's two other channels, but uh, I didn't. I actually did not get this right away. I got his solo stuff right away, um, but I did pick this up. And getting his solo stuff obviously led. Well, let me see what he did with Chick. Chick actually is the last keyboardist of the pile. I I got into. To be honest, um, I always thought his stuff was too complex. But then when you're twenty something, it probably does come across as too complex. But once I got close to thirty, I got it and I enjoyed it immensely. Now I can't get enough of it. So. Um, this is this starts out with a scorcher. Welcome worlds. It just that's where you want to start a record with. Um, and yes, the, the chicks uh, keyboard play pieces are exactly that interludes. They're nice. And it's very chick. Uh, he's always got a great sense of composition. Uh, the other thing was now funny thing with these records, the ones we've been reviewing. Um, the keyboard was heavy handed in terms of the production. And what I noticed is that Chick is obviously a bit up in the mix compared to everyone else, except at the beginning of Vulcan Words, no doubt about it. It's the rhythm section. But and what I couldn't help but notice listening to the heads, Chick would always be on the left, and I'd hear Al on the right, Al on the right. When we get to Earth Juice, now from what I was trying to discover, that was a jam. It, yes, it was it was forced to try to be commercial, but it was actually a jam session. They just all four got in the state, you know, the studio together and just had at it. And what I thought was interesting is this is the only song where the channels are flipped, where I'm hearing Al on my left and Chick in my right. So I'm mm -hmm. like, different. But, um, you know, deeming this this is Al's debut, he scorches, scorches through and through. Whenever he gets his chance, he's a little, like, he, he is a little bit buried in the mix. And that could have been intentional. You know, he's 20 years old. I know keep, people keep saying he was 19. Chick picked him up at 19. But he actually turned 20 during the sessions. So he he was obviously quite drunk. But man, if I was at Berkeley at that time, I would my jaw would be on the ground all day long watching that guy perform mm -hmm. because he just has it this whole time on this record. Um my only my only issue actually is um beyond the seventh galaxy is very good. I, I always thought that um Song to the Power Kings just starts out a little too slow. And if we cut up on the keys just a little in the beginning, no, not be like a three and a half minute intro, but like a minute and a half, it, it would have been a lot 
a lot more a lot more easier to digest um but what we get is what we get and this is de definitely in terms of the other the other two this is definitely number number two of the, of the three thus far or basically the number two based on the four but definitely far superior to the other two it's really really good Pete, I'm interested to see where you go here. So, George, you remember a couple of weeks ago when we were when you were when you picked out these four, and I found out that this was the RTF that was going to be on the show, and I was like, "Really? Yeah, we both above Romantic Warrior?" Because I thought, you know, most unanimously, most people pick Romantic Warrior, and so it's interesting that Rate Your Music had this one listed as the most popular out of them, which is. If he picked Romantic Warrior, it would all be Columbia Records. All four of the correct. picks would be Columbia Records. That so is correct. Be... Yeah, I'm wow. Can I help? I noticed that myself. Yeah, that would have been interesting. So, and I've uh, I've often joked with George over the years that my favorite Return to Forever album always seems to alternate between three of them: uh, this one, Romantic Warrior. And uh, him in the Seventh Galaxy. For whatever reason, No Mystery never was my favorite RTF album. I really like it a lot, but I always seem to like the others more so. So when we did the Return to Forever ranking, however long ago that was, uh, I had picked this as my favorite Return to Forever album at, at the time. Uh, I think Romantic Warrior has crept back into the lead for me. Uh, probably three, four, six months from now, him in the Seventh Galaxy will probably be back at number one. That's just the way it goes with this band. But anyway, um, I like this a lot. This, I think, is is really different from the other three of the electric era. Um, I like Chick's Little Pieces here. I kind of wish there was, like, less of them and one more full band track, I guess. Like, instead of three, maybe give us one, make it three minutes long, and then give us another three or four minute long band track. Um, you know, Vulcan Worlds is absolutely terrific. Of course, that's a great Stanley Clark song. Uh, Shadow of Low, Killer, Beyond the Seventh Galaxy is really cool, even though it's kind of like a revisit of themes from the first out from the first electric album, which I'm okay with. I love Earth Juice. I wish it was longer. I kind of like where they were going with that. Song to the Pharaoh Kings is incredible. Uh, I agree with, I think uh, Eric was talking about how Lenny and Stanley are just like off the charts amazing on this album. And I, I find the more I listen to this album, this is a pretty funky album for them. Uh, Lenny White is all over this album and got to give credit to the young kid who comes on here and just blazes. I think uh, I agree with you, Joe. I think he has produced better and he's better suited in the mix on follow-up records, but I still think Al sounds great and Chick is Chick. Chick is amazing no matter what. So uh, yeah, you know, if it wasn't for my number one, this is would have been a no brainer here because I absolutely love this band and this lineup, but um Number one is kind of tough to beat for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to talk myself into changing all day, but I really can't. This is the my personality versus Pete's usual personality. Is it the consistent listen, or is it the one with the two songs that are just so off the charts good? I'll go Return to Forever. Uh Vulcan Worlds and Song of the Pharaoh Kings, I like more than any songs on these albums, all of them. But some of these other things, the the interludes, I like them, but they do present a momentum issue for me. I don't like that all, when bands do that. And Earth Juice, I'm going to disagree with you guys. I don't like that song. Oh. That is, it's a disco tune, basically, <laughs> for the better like, yes. the melody. I mean, <laughs> Lenny White's playing four on the floor with the bass drum the whole way through. They did release it as a seven-inch single, so you know they were trying to room for the radio. Okay, it's not terrible, but you know, for this band, I'm I hear it and I'm like, what are you guys doing? You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't Return to Forever, but you know, it's not bad. Uh, Shadow of Low, interesting. It was supposed to be Shadow of Io. It's a moon, one of Jupiter's moons is called yeah. Io, but they mm -hmm. put the the label thought it was a small L when they turned in the, the text for everything. So and then that's how it ended up being called Shadow of Low. Uh, Beyond the Seventh Galaxy, or we were reworking of him in the Seventh Galaxy. Not quite as good, but it burns anyways. Yeah. It's really good. <clears throat> as, as much as I like it though, just 
you know, the little issues are enough to put it behind one of the all time jamming albums. So it's my number two. Third? All right. We have no surprises left, right? No. <laughs> John McLaughlin and Jerry Goodman. I, I've said it a million times. You guys know I love guitar, but I also love violin. The thing I have to say about this is, um, and it's it's also true, I think, with the Return to Forever record is, we've talked about how Herbie Hancock is funky in Black, um, Black Market from Weather Report. Maybe it's a little more on the jazz side. I think these two bring the rock. And that's where I came from. I grew up listening to rock music and I've kind of gone into fusion. So these two, Mahavishnu being my number one, to me, it's it's that's where it is. It just, these guys can blow away any rock band and they play like a rock. I mean, this is so raw and so aggressive. I don't have to talk about certain songs because I think other than, what is it, like um, Lotus and Irish Streams is kind of mellows things out, but I get to hear violin, so I'm fine with that. Um, this real, if you give this to a rock fan, I, I, I don't know how they don't enjoy it. Um, as complex as it is, it's just, it's raw, aggressive meeting of the spirits, opening things up, um, just killer, uh, noonward race. Uh, you can go right down the list. I mean, I, I just, I guess I can't believe at times how powerful and raw this really sounds because you don't always associate raw with something that complex, right? That rawness could be the punk parade or whatever. I mean, this is so raw. But yet, it it slots right into that fusion, bringing the rock and the jazz together. Um, I don't, and they're memorable. I mean, stuff like Dance of the Maya, that riff, if that doesn't stick in your head, you know, come on. So you're writing complex music, catchy. You can't go wrong with Goodman and McLaughlin, the rest of the band, Cobham, Bard, Hammer. I mean... I don't know. I'd give this to anybody who likes rock music and and say you you got to listen to this. If you don't like fusion, listen to this. If you're a rock fan, uh, I don't know how it can miss. It just kills me. So that's my number one is Mahavishnu Orchestra. Like, of course, this one. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I've been a heavy metal hard rock guy my whole life. <laughs> And uh, this this would be, I mean, to any other like metalhead, I would it would be a perfect introduction to them because the guitars are blazing, and then when they get slower, it's it's still eerie and weird, and um, yeah, I mean, and it, yeah, the the addition of the of the violin is is awesome. So I've been I've been getting into that lately, um, but yeah. Uh, you really can't go wrong with it, especially the last track where everybody just kind of explodes and it gets their shit in, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's my number one, Intermounting Flying. Joe? So I, I want to give a little bit of backdrop to this one because this one was unlike the others. The other ones I had to work up to. This one, um, I usually take a lot of, a lot of car rides. I know, George, you... You see my Facebook, I do take a lot of car rides. I mean, it's usually two hours, three hours. So I, I try to look at the low end of the dial. So this was like late 80s. I'm driving back. It's like 11 o'clock at night, some college station. And I just hear this cacophony going full on. I'm going, what is this? And then the arpeggiated line. And I'm like, who is that? So um, five minutes later, I get home. I called the radio station. Oh, you know, Dance of Maya. You know, it's it's Maya Vishnu. And I'm like, no way. No way. I never heard it. Never heard it. So uh, I got it, and I wasn't disappointed. Um, funny enough, this is the only record uh, that's produced by a guitar player. Um, and I think we all are, are some level of guitar aficionados on this panel right now. Um, to me, it's the template of all fusion albums. It really is. It's got the fast and slow, the loud and soft, the call and response, uh, interplay, cacophony, and unison. It's got it all. I mean, you were saying the the Lotus song, yeah, it's very delicate, but it just goes the whole gamut of what you want to hear. Um, if you like a, a wide palette, um, yes, there's a lot of distortion on all accounts. Um, and I would say, yeah, the engineering did go to the red a few times on it, but it's just it's just nonstop fire. And it it, it give 
it gives you some time to breathe, but even the way it ends, I mean, uh, it bookends, it bookends, bookends on firepower. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely the one that leaps above the others as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I have this copy besides the Mount Bowl Fidelity, I have the box set that it's in. I mean, you keep getting it because you hope you're going to hear it slightly different, but you know, <laughs> it still sounds the same and it still is great. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the great debuts of all time. <clears throat> and uh, whether you call it jazz, whether you call it jazz fusion or jazz rock or proc, whatever, who cares? It's great. That's what it is. I mean, there's, it doesn't matter what tag you put to it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I remember the first time I heard this album, I was actually I was in college and uh, this guy who was living next door to me, who was a deadhead, but he listened to some jazz and I was just a metal guy. And I went over to his apartment one afternoon. We were cutting out of class and uh, we uh, did some recreational stuff. And uh, he put this album on and I was kind of like, who in the hell is that guitar player, man? <laughs> that's John McLaughlin. I'm like, oh, that's that McLaughlin dude I've seen in Guitar Player magazine and whatnot. I'm like, this is some crazy, spacey, jazzy shit, right? And I was never the same after that. I was never the same. And before you know it, I was listening to to me all the solo stuff and return to forever and all sorts of other shit. But um, yeah, this is just great. And this is, uh, you know, the it's interesting how it's called the inner mounting flame. I think this could have been called Savage and Grace because that's like what this album is all about. When it's angry and fast and raucous, it's savage as all hell. Yet when it's tranquil and gentle and light, it's just absolute grace maybe grace and fire is another great name for it i don't know but every song on here is amazing uh that you get different flavors of the band and every guy kills it on here i mean whether it's mclaughlin or goodman or hammer or cobham for crying out loud sounds great on here and even rick laird you know he, he doesn't stand out like the rest of them but you can't do the album without him it's just so good it's so good absolute classic that this was a no-brainer for number one for me yep <clears throat> Uh, one thing I always lament when I hear this is that the the keyboard rigs that Jan Hammer had at, at the time, he, he does too. He says he wishes he had a Moog on here. He's doing a lot of electric pianos. That's, yeah. that's what there was. And some of the songs, especially Meeting of the Spirits, my favorite song, when he comes in, it's almost a letdown tone-wise. I mean, the playing is kick-ass, but after, after McLaughlin and Goodman both sound so wicked and he comes in with that electric piano it's like a little bit of a, a letdown when you hear some of the boots you're like oh wow yeah this would have been great if they had it in the studio but i mean just that's a very small thing to complain about here because the rest of this just smokes i mean noonward race vital transformation <laughs> awakening it's probably my second favorite song that's incredible that's um yeah just everything's great on here um yeah, Dance of Maya. In the, in the uh, Mahavishnu bio, the author interviews everybody. He takes one song from each album and he interviews all the guys about it and asks for like you know notes or whatever. Three of the guys count it in a different way. They they cite a different time signature. That's how confusing it is. The guys in the band aren't even all counted a different way. I think I, I counted in ten eight, but. You know, I'm not the greatest at counting, so who knows? But uh, yeah, this is just, it's classic for a reason. I mean, there was some official fusion, I guess, before this, but this formulated the genre. The, the way everyone else pattered their shit afterwards is due to this. So, you know, it's sheet. really, I'm sorry, go ahead. The sheet music for Dance of Maya is written in 10 8. That's how I hear it. Yeah, it, it, but I, I, to me, it, yeah, no, I, I swear there's an odd beater in there somewhere, but the sheet music's 10 8. So, what's fascinating for me is that if you follow the career of John McLaughlin and you listen to like all those Miles Davis records he played on and the Tony Williams Lifetime stuff, all of which is great, it's almost like that doesn't even prepare you for what he does on this album. No. This is like molten, right? Like what like what happened all of a sudden, right? Well, from what I am impressed upon, I didn't know for you this weekend I'm I'm a Glock and didn't probably know all his children he has in France, but uh the uh he was I can't help but notice 
he was basically doing his best Coltrane. When Miles told him, go and get your own band, he got his own band and said, I'm going to crank up the distortion and do my best imitation of Coltrane I can on his Gibson 12.6 SG or whatever make it is. Because it's definitely he's definitely emulating Coltrane. Um, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Yeah, he definitely also, because he's it's pretty clear he's playing a fuzz box, I believe, on a lot of this album. And I I don't think he used one with Miles. And I You're right. I think it was Wawa. Yeah, and, and the Wawa, yeah, for sure. Um, and even, you know, even the the playing is pretty raucous on that first uh lifetime album, but it's not like this. I mean, this is this is like on another level. Two two interesting things I did want to ask the panel if they were able to pick up on it. A new word race. I couldn't help but notice that Jerry Goodman's uh, violin was going through a Leslie. Yeah, it's I don't recall ever hearing anyone pull that stunt off. And it just, that makes him almost be on par with what McLaughlin was doing on that particular track. And then on Awakening, um, Jan Hammer. Now he's clearly playing electric piano, but I swear he's doing something that gets a pitch bend sound and i could not figure out for life me what he did um it's just amazing i'm like that's clearly pitch bending but there's no way it wasn't around he wasn't he wasn't using that kind of equipment so it definitely wasn't a, a engineering technique that's for sure interesting <clears throat> all right well the george's pick this month i wanted to stay in this era it's hard to put a 70s one past Pete, but this kind of qualifies. Flying Island, self-titled. Uh, I did send it to Pete a few months ago, but we haven't talked about it, so it kind of still works. And Eric hasn't heard it. So I gave you some violin, Eric. What did you think? Uh, well, thank you for that. And uh, <laughs> I really <laughs> I really like this. I, I thought... Um, I think we talked with Chris a little bit about this too um, online because does Chris Fox know a couple of these guys or just that they had played in? Well, they're Maryland? from the same area. Okay, so they're they're Connecticut or something, right? Greenwich. Remember, they're from Greenwich, the southern part of the state. Um, the only thing that surprised me with this, I guess, is the a lot of the songs are short um, in comparison. But I find that, again, these songs really catch you um you hear them a couple times and they get in your head i kind of like the elp-ish intro of the second track um the birds wear gas masks i birds think is that one masks, is, yeah. that, is that is <laughs> that even name? the birds wear gas masks yeah. but it has kind of like an elp feel on the intro to that one um and they kind of lay back on some songs too um i think my favorite track was time bound wizard I thought that they just really crushed. Um, it, it kind of felt like the band let loose a little bit on that one. Um, but I really, you know, I think you get kind of a prog rock feel with, uh, is it a Quillian wave? Um, that yes. one kind of had a prog yes. feel to that one. Um, and I, I just, I can listen to violin all day. And I thought the guitar, there's some really nice guitar playing on this. Um, I, I like the way this was put together. I did go out to rate your music george after you sent this to me and i saw they had another one um yeah. right after right like this is 75 i think and then 76 yeah um independent releases or were these on they're on vanguard which was larry coriel and 11 house oh, okay but right. uh they remain in vinyl hell so ah okay um <laughs> but i i don't know where you find this stuff to be honest um I but credit uh our uh Almost was a panelist tonight, Steve Barnes. Oh, okay. his uh, morning, good morning coffee posts. Uh, he does all these posts. Uh, of, there's certain YouTube pages that post whole albums from 70s. He's on top of those really big time. And this was one of his from last summer. Well, I mean, it's a band I'm sure I don't know that I would have come across otherwise, but I, I really enjoyed this. And I'll just ask you because you sent, you know, like you said, you sent this to me. Second one, just as good in yeah, the same ballpark. Okay, yeah. yeah, terrific band. I mean, get them out. Get it. Somebody put it out on CD, right? Get it out there. We know a guy, but I don't know. I brought it up to him. I don't. I don't remember. What said. <laughs> uh, you 
get a chance to listen to it, Mike? I, you know what? For some reason, I thought you were talking about another kind of space. Oh, okay. so I, I've, been, I've been listening to that one, but I really like it. It's really good. Um, there's, um, I don't know. Are you? You're you're familiar with it, right? Yeah. 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 That's. It's a very that, similar record. I, it, I'm, I'm sure it is. Uh, I don't. I don't understand how it's not. It wasn't as big. I mean, is it because it came out in the mid '70s? And, you know, and all that stuff, all that prog rock stuff was really, really huge in the early 70s and just kind of kind of faded away. I guess it's possible. Yeah. But um, yeah, the first track, it's like it, it reminds me of like uh, like like some kind of like Warriors Return to like 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 a like a movie soundtrack thing. And um, and there's a couple of earworms like the, the vision, the vision and the voice. How it's got that one riff that do 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 do. Do Dan, it it just never gets boring. Like Eric said, this band to me is a, a riff writing band, like opposed to a lot of fusion bands are play the head and solo. They're pretty much a riff writing band, and that's why the songs are complex. They're not out to blow you away with the uh, shock chops or whatever. They're they're about songs. So yeah, I would I would say it's more more a uh, prog like seventy. If they had a vocalist, they'd probably be up there with yes, but. We're good. Keep the vocalist oh, yeah. out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard to find a good vocalist, I guess. True, true. You know? And uh, Dandelion Wine was another good standout for me on that one. It, it, it's just, it's just ear, earworm riffs all, all over the place. I, I really liked it. But I didn't listen to the first one. <laughs> Joe, what do you think of it? Well, you know, it's when you, when you, when you supplied it and, you, and uh, well, yeah, it's not in not in digital format per se, but uh, yeah, I don't know the recording that's uh, through a certain channel. Uh, it's definitely from vinyl, so I don't know if the vinyl is a little bit uh, glossed over. Uh, but it definitely sounds like the production was very tinny, um, and that may be from the compression of being on vinyl. I don't know, but uh, the second track, which was the "Even the Birds Wear Gas Masks," I, be, now I grew up in Fairfield County and stagger through Fairfield County. It's not just one town. So I got different radio stations, particularly from the island through the years, um, Long Island, that is. And mm -hmm. I swear one of the stations from there played that song frequently. It could have been BAB. It could have been USB. Uh, but I don't know. Someone played that song. I've heard it since the 80s. Um, catchy. I liked it a lot. Nice unison. The one thing about the, the record is a lot of unison lines. Yes. Uh, Ray Smith on guitar and Faith Fra Fralioli. And violin, they just grew. Um, and the drumming is very good. Bill Bacon, he's yeah. got a Lenny Wright, White, White thing going on. Maybe not the overall band has a Ma Fisher thing going on, but he definitely has a Lenny Wright thing going on. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the next couple of tracks uh, was A Priestess of Fantasy and Arrow Jester. They're okay, but they did get it. That's when it start, sound a little dated. That's probably the best way to explain it. I don't know, again, if it was just production of the time. You know, this is in a Columbia Records production, that's for sure. Um, but they, uh, but where it really started kicking is when they got Joe Fer Farrell on uh, sax on the next. Uh, I meant tracks. to say that Joe, I like, I did I absolutely like sublime. When he came in. It, it, yeah, it creates that dynamic that seems to be missing on those other two tracks. They just, uh, they impressed me a lot, particularly Eddie. The longer tracks in this record, and I, I do agree, there were short tracks, and maybe that, maybe that's due to the keyboard player. The keyboard player did compose most of this stuff so um it may be a reflection of him but there's a lot of space uh, on those tracks with, with Farrell and I really enjoyed it um the title track Flying Islands I really enjoyed a lot but where this record really shows its worth is I Love to Dance that is them doing their best Mahavishnu possible um it starts slow but unlike the other tracks I've said it kicks in fast, and Ray Smith goes full on psychedelic for a good three and a half minutes. I just loved it, loved it. That's my wheelhouse. Uh, the whole psych prog jazz thing, I can listen to it all day long, over and over again. As a matter of fact, I must have heard that track seven times in a row because so I was like, "This is otherworldly." I didn't see this coming as a. That's how you end a record, first and foremost. But it was it was just sublime, absolutely spectacular. Really enjoyed it. So I'm trying to find the vinyl because doesn't it would be great if they put the two records out as a twofer, but yeah. I just don't see it happening. 
Probably just not. to see it happening. So I have to buy. I there's funny enough, there's a place in Long Island that has a sealed copy. I I have to get it because that last track was just worth the price of admission. Absolutely really good. Pete, what's your take? I think this is a pretty tremendous album, and I think it's one of the best unknown fusion albums of the seventies. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was uh, you know, George made a CD of it and and the second one months ago. And I listened to it a bunch when he first sent it over. I really liked it. But then, of course, I moved on to like five million other things. So when it was time to get ready to do this show, uh, I started listening to it again. And then I, I went on one day I was working and I just figured out, let me see he was, you know, out of my sight. So I said, all right, let me just pull it up on YouTube and uh, play it through there. And then I started looking at the comments. I was like, oh, there's a whole shitload of comments for this, you know, fairly unknown album. And then I'm going down. And then I see Bill Bacon, the drummer, is actually commenting down there and he's like fascinated that like so many people are talking about this you know kind of long forgotten album that he worked on right and uh so i started i started commenting down there and then he started conversing with me and he was like i told him we were going to be talking about it in the show and he was like wow that's so cool i have to go watch it he goes i you know so long ago and blah 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 anyway um I think when this album really works, it works really, really well. I agree with Joe. I Love to Dance is just kick-ass. There's actually probably three songs on here that really hit like those Mahavishnu highs. That's one of them. I think Eddie is another one, although it's more of like a mellower Mahavishnu. I think they also, I think it's Mike who mentioned that there's some prog going on here. Um, Priestess of Fantasy, I hear Camel in that song a little bit especially in the keyboards. Uh, I hear a little bit of Return to Forever here and there. I hear tons of Jean-Luc Ponty and the Dixie Dregs, and that's because of the violin. But like... Uh, even I think the it predates the Dixie Dregs, though, doesn't it? it yeah, yes. yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. So maybe it's more of like it's more of like a kind of mid-70s, I think, Jean-Luc Ponty that I'm really hearing, uh, especially on two or three tracks. And then she's a really, really good violin player. I, I really like the interplay with the guitar. It's nice keys on here. I like this a lot. I think this is really good. If there's folks watching this show and they're very familiar with the four albums we talked about before, but they're kind of like flying island. I don't know what the hell this is. Go out, stop what you're doing and go out and look it up. It was released in 1975, self-titled Flying Island. You will not regret it. Really, really good stuff. I, I think this is a terrific, terrific album. And I'm really happy we're talking about it in this program with these other four legendary albums. Yeah, uh, I think it's really good. Like you said, one of the, the better underrated unknown seventies pieces. Uh, I think the, if the production was better in some ways. It would help. Uh, the soloing tones don't seem to stand out like a, other records that the production helps the solo stand out. Um, I'm sure they were on a problem. I'm not sure, but I would assume they were on a budgetary restrictions compared to the other bands we were talking about that were saying they're all in Columbia or Polydor. So I'm sure that was a different deal. I, I don't think Vanguard was probably up at that level. But uh, there's no bad song on this. This is really good throughout. Uh, Eddie's the one palate cleanser. Everything else around it tends to be up, up tempo, good riffs, just concise tunes. Really good. And another kind of space. Did you like that one as much, Pete? Yeah. Kind of yeah. yeah, you know, so who knows what they would have done? I guess maybe Bill can put in the comments why they uh, packed it in. Did they have enough for a third album or whatever? But uh, yeah, people look it up. It's on YouTube. You know, I went and downloaded plaque files and burned them to CD. You can do that. I don't know if it's on streamers or not. That's up to you to figure. No, out. No. no, no, no. I did. It's funny in the comments. Bill Bacon did mention he tried to get the band back together 15 years ago because three of them still live relatively close to each other, not necessarily in Connecticut or in, or in Fairfield County, but they definitely still live in close proximity to each other and nothing doing. Mm -hmm. I, I know Jeff Bowe went Hollywood and uh, the keyboard player and, you know, I'm sure he doesn't want to partake, but why do, why three of the, you know, the guitarist, keyboard, or even a bass player? That's, that's why I, I did want to add in terms of that last track. That's the only track where Tom Prelly on his bass go gets thumping. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I do lament that they, because they play locally. Uh, I guess Faith does still play in uh, Dutchess County, or uh, I'm not good with the New York counties as much, but the counties that favor the Panhandle of Connecticut um, in Port Chester, just south of there. 
Um, they, so they still play, but they, they're doing their own things. I get, you know, fusion is not the most marketable thing, so I guess you have to really love <laughs> to do it. We put a festival together. Yeah, maybe they don't love it anymore. I don't know. An another kind of space is on Spotify. Okay. Via the first one isn't. So that is on the that is that's the one that's on probably the rest of the streaming services like Apple and all that. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They're on the same label, but one. Yeah, I I don't get it either. Sometimes stuff drops off on all those streaming oh. services, then it reappears. And yeah, I've got another kind of space on Apple Music. Of that stuff. Well, well, here's an interesting thing. I I don't know that record because um, I just met, went on based what was provided. But Bova pretty much has all the compositions on the first record. Does he have all the compositions on the second record too? I don't recall. And that that could be a case. I mean, whoever writes the songs because they dictate where they can be. I always so. tell people get hard copies. You don't let some streamer control what you can listen to. Get a hard copy. Correct. Correct. Yeah. All right. Well, next month, George's pick, MSM Schmidt, Life. Um, this is a German keyboard player relocated to LA area. Uh, he's got like seven or eight albums. And uh, next month will be the first of our regional squares. This will be part of a German four square. So four German artists and then uh, George's pick. So definitely tune in for that. We will have a returning guest, Mike Jacobs, he hasn't been on since last summer. A good friend of ours. We wanted to have him back, and he's part German. So I said, come on, man. Come talk to <laughs> awesome. So stay tuned uh, one month from now for the next episode of Four Fusion Friday as we uh, go on vacation to Germany. Well, we're not actually going on vacation. We're taking a trip to Germany. So uh, I want to thank both Mike and Joe for participating here today. Thank and, you. Uh, as always, George does a fine job of officiating these episodes and Eric just being you is damn terrific. So <laughs> it works. <laughs> so thanks for watching everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together. All, all the damn, damn time. time. Happy Eric, birthday. Mike, Joe and George. I am Pete. Thanks for watching, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Stay tuned for Martin Popoff and myself at the Fun House in just a little bit. Till then, have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye.